if I think back to parliamentary moments, I think the debate in 2003 when Blair made a very, very persuasive and powerful speech in favor of war or, or against Iraq, I think he changed people's minds in that chamber with the force of his swasoria, with the force of his persuasion. What will Saddam feel? Strengthened beyond measure. What will the other states who tyrannize their people, the terrorists who threaten our existence, what will they take from that? That the will confronting them is decaying and feeble. Who will celebrate and who will weep if we take our troops back from the Gulf now? Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the whole House will join me in condemning totally this unprovoked aggression by the government of Argentina against British territory. The voice is unmistakable, but Margaret Thatcher's career in oratory is a strange one. Well, M Margaret certainly began making the impression of speaking stridently, and that didn't make it particularly attractive. But she very quickly uh, took advice about that, and suddenly it was still a black. And so we had a series of mad voices that were ridiculously husky, or um, plaintive, or hmm, uh, thoughtful. She wasn't a naturally graceful speaker like an Obama. Um, she wasn't, um, she didn't have the sort of eloquence and the sort of grit of a Churchill, but she conveyed exactly what she needed to convey, which was um, passionate belief in, in what needed to be done and the toughness of what she was doing. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> The ladies not for turning. Good evening. Sir Geoffrey Howe, Mrs. Thatcher's longest serving colleague throughout her years in power, turned on her in the Commons today and accused her of risking the nation's future. Geoffrey Howe um, had resigned. He was going to make his resignation speech. We all went in for it. We were all saying, oh my God, another boring Geoffrey Howe speech. And for the first and last time in his life, Geoffrey Howe had the house riveted. The point, the point, Mr. Speaker, was perhaps more sharply put by a British businessman trading in Brussels and elsewhere who wrote to me last week. People throughout Europe, he said, see our Prime Minister's finger wagging and hear her passionate, no, 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 much more clearly than the content of the carefully worded formal texts. Extraordinary. The most boring man in Parliament finished off the career of the Iron Lady. It's rather like sending your opening batsmen to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. <laughs> of course, even that clear metaphor wasn't always clearly understood. Uh, not all that long ago, I was doing some shopping locally with a friend and happened to pass a chap, a postman who was emptying a post box and rather uncharacteristically in a sort of dinicilia way I greeted him and he looked up at my friend and said, who was that bloke then? Is he the chap who attacked Margaret Thatcher with a cricket bat? If he wants to reply, you are... in that case, Mr Blair, yes? So he's allowing him to have a fourth question or to reply to the Prime Minister's challenge. I think we'll put... I think, I think, Madam Speaker... If you think, think this Madam sounds like a rabble, you should have been here on April Madam the 20th, 1653, when Cromwell addressed a few well-chosen words to the rump parliament. It is high time for me to put an end to your sitting in this place, which you have dishonoured by your contempt of all virtue and defied by your practice of every vice. Ye are a factious crew and enemies to all good government. Ye are a pack of mercenary wretches and would, like Esau, sell your country for a mess of pottage and, like Judas, betray your God for a few pieces of money. 
Cromwell didn't need to persuade. He was there to vent his anger at those he thought were preventing him from creating a godly society. And he had a group of armed musketeers with him too, which helps. That is one of the great speeches. I mean, if you read it, um, it's the disgust for these, for, these, um, for these politicians, for these wicked, lazy, corrupt politicians. Prostitutes. These prostitutes, you know, the way he, the, the, the disdain of this man of God, this brilliant soldier, this dictator, you know, Britain's only military dictator, the way he throws them out. Um, the astonishing contempt in the speech. It is one of the greatest speeches. Can you not defy this sacred place and turn the Lord's temple into a den of thieves? by your immoral principles and wicked practices. Ye are grown intolerably odious to the whole nation. You were deputed here by the people to get grievances redressed. So, take away that shining bauble there and lock up the doors. In the name of God, go. What do you think? I would have a pause before the last sentence. Uh, oh, in the name of God. A telling pause. And then, but what's the, what's, what's the words? What's the words before that? What's the sentence before that? Take away that shining bauble there and lock up the doors. In, then it's pause. In the name of God, go. And lock up the doors. In the name of God, go. In your own way, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful, intelligent, friends of all ages, races, and measurements, U.S. citizens, worldwide residents, whatever your religion is or sexual preference, there's no... One of the reasons parliamentary oratory, indeed all oratory, might seem diminished and out of date is the media revolution, which we've all lived through. Obama's campaign was utterly web-savvy and built from the ground up. The first great change was when speeches started being printed in newspapers, and people said then that oratory would never be the same. Then came radio. There is a sense of real history. A brighter day will come. If we are conquered, all will be enslaved. And the United States will be left single-handed to guard the rights of men. The radio is the great barrier of this. Radio suddenly becomes speech as oratory. It reaches millions and millions and millions of people. So all oratory has to be looked on before and after radio. Churchill's intimate connection with his audience through the new medium was not lost on the politicians, and by the early 60s, television had come to number 10. Well, there you are. You can see what it's like. The camera's hot, probing eye. These monstrous machines and their attendants, a kind of 20th century torture chamber, that's what it is. But I must try and forget all this paraphernalia and imagine that you are sitting here in the room with me. If television gave a new intimacy, its gaze could also be merciless, and details of presentation came to matter more than ever before. We hit the one minute switch, please. In 1960, the first televised debate between presidential candidates John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon set the pattern for the future. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. Now we're in a completely different phase and have been in the last sort of ever since the sort of, you know, the Kennedy-Nixon debates really. But our disagreement is not about the goals for America, but only about the means to reach those goals. When actually we see every facial expression, we see sweat, we see fear, we, we hear many different sort of um, intonations, we can see into these people's eyes, and that again changes oratory completely. And now oratory is, is, um, is, is about seeing as well as hearing, and it's about millions of people seeing these things at one moment, and seeing things that they can, you can never take back. The question before us is, which point of view and which party do we want to leave the United States? Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. Television brought its own relentless rhythm. The length of a major party candidate soundbite in 1968 was over 42 seconds. By 1988, it had shrunk to 9.8 seconds. Now, it's less than five. 
One hour to go before Obama is due to deliver his inaugural address. What will he say? And how are these words arrived at? We know he has a team of speechwriters, including the 27-year-old John Favreau. But as to who writes what, that's a secret known only to a few, and none of them is telling. And then, unbelievably, here it comes. The most keenly awaited words on the planet right now, spluttering out of the fax machine. If you want to know the detail, the intensity, the research and word-by-word -word analysis which goes into an important speech, then there's frankly no more authoritative source than the West Wing. America, the enemies of humanity itself, we say here tonight with one voice, there is no corner of this earth so remote, no cave so dark, that you will not be found and brought to light and ended. That's a number spike. Hey, crank that up. You broke 65 on all the lines. Major speeches are analyzed by pollsters and run past focus groups to find the key words which press the right buttons in the audience. We nearly had one almost. But this is nothing to the work that goes into constructing them. Memos are written. They come from everywhere. Every agency, department, senior advisor, outside notable. What's an outside notable? Former presidents. Henry Kissinger, Bill Gates, Jesse Jackson. Mr. Rogers wants to write us a memo. We'll read it. We'll pass some of them on to the president, and he'll start making notes in the margins. Then we have the president's first thoughts meeting. That's when we all want to kill ourselves. Why? Because that's when the president tells us we're nowhere. Why? Because we're nowhere. So we try to figure out what people want to hear. And that's when anybody who didn't want to kill themselves before has certainly been converted to the cult. Why is it so hard? Because it's a white piece of paper. How high are the stakes? How high can we count? So what do you do? Whenever it takes to get started. And we read new memos, and we try new themes, and we hear new slogans, and we test new lines, and after a few weeks of that, you've still got a white piece of paper. Being a political speechwriter is like writing for the movies. First, you're always part of a team. Second, you always have to remember, you're not writing what you would say. You are writing for a character, and you have to construct the character in your mind and understand him. And you have to say, in this situation, look, I might do this or that, but my character, uh, my character would do something else. So you have to write, what would the character say? Franklin Roosevelt had a speechwriter by the name of Sam Rosenman who called it the grind and the glamour. Um, and I would add to that the ratio of grind to glamour is probably three to one. Some of the, the more painful moments in my, in my diaries relate to when we write in the conference speech. It could be absolute agony. Tony seemed to need these kind of three in the morning, four in the morning, crisis of confidence, it's all terrible, it's all crap, let's start again. We are back as the party of the majority in British politics. Back to speak up for Britain. Back as the People's Party. Now, what would usually happen is that I'd prov pro provide a, a first draft, which he'd look at in a really perfunctory way. And then he'd say, well, what it needs are these three things, one, two, three. And at first, I'd protest, no, but the, all three things are in there already, Prime Minister. They're, it's already full of that stuff. I soon learned that I should say at that point, Yes, Prime Minister, absolutely right. Yeah, of course. I'll go away and put those three things in. And then I'd give him more or less the same draft two days later, and he'd say, that's much more like it. And then we proceed from there. I mean, some of the scenes, if, if people had seen some of the scenes when we were writing late at night, when Tony would be sort of there with his hair all over the place and kind of just wearing a dressing gown, and literally, we had this sort of... <laughs> we never used to throw old drafts away. They'd all li be lying around on the floor. It was, and you'd have sort of food being brought in and not cleared away because he didn't want the people to come and disturb him, to take the food away. So you'd have these trays piling up, and it's all a bit sordid, really. The most terrifying moment in every process was about 15 minutes before the Prime Minister would go and deliver the speech, he'd say, have you got any jokes? As though jokes come entirely disembodied from the process of writing. There's this sort of obsession with getting some funny lines in it. Where's the jokes? We haven't got any jokes. Monday night, we haven't got any jokes. There's nothing funny in here. And then there'd be this sort of scrabble around. And I can remember at one point we had Roy Hudd uh, sent through some absolutely brilliant, brilliant one-liners. Um, some, I think one or two of which we used and then some of which we, we saved for John Prescott on Friday. <laughs>
And there was room for a joke or two, like this one on the Channel Tunnel. The French got the high-speed link, we got the slow coach link, but then we've got the Tories. It's like stand-up. And it, every stand-up comedian knows that if you don't get your response, you die. You've got to remember, a Labour Party conference, um, it's not just the person up there who's doing the speech that's a bit nervous, the audience is a bit nervous sometimes. A lot of those speeches came at really difficult moments. Warmed by an affectionate welcome, Neil Kinnock today took the toughest road for any political leader, to chip away not just at his opponents, but at the prejudices of his own supporters. There are words that I've been wanting to say for years, but I had to time it in the right place so that I was speaking directly to the Labour movement and confronting them with this idiocy that was going on from the ultra-left. Ultra I'll tell you what happens with impossible promises. You start with far-fetched resolutions. They are then pickled into a rigid dogma, a code. And you go through the years sticking to that, outdated, misplaced, irrelevant to the real needs, and you end in the grotesque chaos of a Labour Council, a Labour Council hiring taxis to scuttle round the city, handing out redundancy notices to its own workers. I knew I had one bullet in the gun, and I hit the target. Liverpool councillors were furious. Liar shouted Derek Hatton. Eric Heffer, the veteran Liverpool MP, didn't want to hear any more, and he stalked out of the hall. Provoked and energised by his opponents in the audience, Kinnock's speech delivered a historic victory against the odds. 